Welcome to the podcast, How to Be Well and Strong. I'm your host, Jacqueline Genova, and I'm excited to have you join me as I speak with some of the leading figures in the fields of wellness, integrative medicine, and mental health as we discover what it truly means to be well and strong in both body and mind. Get ready to be empowered, inspired, and motivated about being an advocate for your own health. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the show. I'm very excited to be speaking with Dr. Kelly Blodgett about an incredibly interesting yet not very well-known topic that I've become very passionate about, and that is the area of biological dentistry. Dr. Kelly Blodgett is redefining the modern dental experience to one that is 100% positive. Over the past 22 years, he has created a practice recognized as an international hotspot for integrative biological dentistry and dental tourism. He attracts people who seek a holistic and biological approach to their oral and whole body health. Through his weekly Toxic Tuesday and Wellness Wednesday social media posts, Dr. Blodgett shares truths not commonly discussed in traditional dental settings. His post series illustrates his patients' incredible health journeys, along with providing best practices for predictable oral and systemic health. Dr. Blodgett, welcome to the show. As I was just saying, I first heard about you and your work from Chris Work's podcast and immediately knew I had to have you on because this is such an important area that so many people fail to consider when they're facing chronic illness. And it's certainly one that has massive health implications, as you very well know. Yeah, well, I'm so grateful that you you came across that uh, the podcast with Chris. I mean, I'm so... Um... I'm so impressed by that gentleman. You know, I mean, he has a great reach and he is sharing wonderful information. And uh, I got to tell you, the number of people who have come to see me because of that direct connection and hearing about the the, the oral conditions that they were experiencing um, and their, their cancer diagnosis and the fact that their oncologists aren't considering or thinking anything about the mouth. Uh, as it relates to their their oncological plan, uh, I'm just so grateful that he's sharing that and and that you are as well, so we can help people understand that what goes on in your mouth is what's happening in your body. It's not. It's ridiculous to say it's connected because it's so obvious. You know, um, there is no difference between oral health and systemic health. It's all one. It's the health of one human entity. So I'm glad that we're going to talk about that today. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Chris. I'm actually having him on the show in October. So I'm very, very excited for that. But Dr. Blodgett, let's just start with the basics. So can you provide an overview of what biological dentistry is and how does it differ from traditional dentistry? That is a a good place to start. So let let me offer this kind of clarity and, and, and I think it will help listeners to appreciate the challenges that dentists face as they might consider moving in the direction of a more biological practice. And that is that in the world of dentistry, there are no biological dental schools, right? Like in the world of medicine, you can have chiropractic schools, um, naturopathic schools, homeopathic schools. In dentistry, it's just dental school, right? That's all there is to it. So In dental schools, most learning happens around a symptomatic management style. You know, you look for inflamed gums and you treat the inflammation. You look for holes in teeth and you drill it, you fill it, you bill it. It, It's very like you're just chasing symptoms. In the world of biological dentistry, that approach looks more from the perspective of how do we amplify the health of the human being so that symptoms don't develop in the first place. Like you have, you actually, your mouth then is an expression of health as is the rest of your body, right? So what I say to patients all the time is the best dentistry is no dentistry. God gave you a perfect set of jaw bones, gum tissue, tooth structure, it's our lifestyle choices most frequently, not always, but most frequently that lead us to experiencing symptoms. So that's the first step of biological dentistry is, you know, help establish and maintain optimal whole body health. And there's no difference again between 
oral health and systemic health, it's all the same. So the second aspect as that differentiates biological dentistry from traditional dentistry is how we look at the materials that we use when we are helping, you know, do dental, res- let's say dental restorations or tooth replacements. You know, it's very common uh, these days for people who are losing teeth to consider, how am I going to replace those teeth, right? For the past 40 years or 50 years, dental implants have become, you know, a, a big, uh, a fashionable, shall we say, a fashionable and common way to replace teeth. The problem for most people is that they're, they're having titanium alloy, metal alloys placed in their jaw bones. If you're not sensitive to any of the parts of that metal alloy, great. It's probably going to work pretty well for you. If you are sensitive to titanium, nickel, uh, you know, any of the, the components within that alloy, you might have systemic health consequences due to that metal being placed inside your body. So um, as a biological dentist, I want to consider what is most appropriate bio-individually for that person. So we might do bio, uh, a, like a biocomp test or a MELISA test to look at uh, the genetics of that human being or their immunological response to materials. We can actually predetermine what filling materials, what ceramics, what implant materials are most appropriate and least reactive for that human being relative to other materials. So you can predetermine that prior to doing dental restorations. That's fascinating. What does that test entail? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it requires a blood draw. A fa- Actually, the, for the biocomp test, you do a fasting blood draw. So when we're doing that in our office, you know, we have to inform the patient, please fast for so long before they come in. Uh, and then we send it to the lab that's in um, Colorado called Biocomp. And they'll analyze that. And usually, you know, a couple weeks later or so, we'll, we'll get that report back. It's a huge report, like it's almost 300 pages long. Wow. Um, and of course, like in my practice, there's a lot of material or information in there that's not pertinent. I don't need to know which titanium implant would be least reactive for them because I don't use titanium implants. But, you know, you pick your sections that are most appropriate for the care for that individual and you can choose from that list. And I know it might sound crazy to, you know, people who've never considered this and most most likely, it sounds crazy to dentists who've never heard of this. I have seen more patients that I can count who have dental restorations done. Let's say it's some dental fillings or some dental crowns. And their body senses energetically that this is not working for them. It's not just too sensitivity. It's like they literally will say, it doesn't feel right. I don't know how to describe it. It's not the bite. You know, I, I'm not my tooth isn't sensitive. This just doesn't feel right. And when we do a biocomp analysis, more often than not, we find their their body is highly reactive to the materials that were used. And it, you know, the bummer is you then have to take it apart again to redo it with materials that are bio, uh, like least reactive for that person. But at least you have good information off of which you can build a plan. Again, these are things you never hear about, right, from your typical traditional dentist. But so, no. so important. And on the topic of of metals. Mercury fillings, I know, is a big area of contention. And I think the irony with that, right, is that the American Dental Association has long insisted that dental amalgams have established a record of safety and effectiveness. But the research, you know, out there tells a very different story. And I know, I think Chris had mentioned this, that mercury is actually the most non-toxic, non-radioactive metal on earth. And the FDA actually reclassified dental amalgam as a quote unquote higher risk. Can you explain the potential risks associated with these fillings? And in what cases do you advocate for their removal? Yeah, good question. Uh, So let's start with some just some straight up common sense. Okay. A box that comes with a skull and a crossbones on it, you know. I mean, I have not used mercury amalgam in my my professional practice ever. Um, but back in dental school, you know, we were, as a matter of fact, in order to get my license in the state of Oregon, you know, I had to put mercury fillings in somebody's mouth to show that I could do it properly, you know, which is kind of crazy. Um, but anyways, on the box, whether you're buying 
you know, brand A, brand B, brand C of, of mercury amalgam fillings. It's a warning toxic substance, you know, like handle with, you know, appropriate safety uh, precautions, blah, blah, blah. That's on the front end. Okay. On the back end, when somebody's having mercury amalgams removed in my practice and every other practice in the state of Oregon, our efflux lines, the lines that take all the suck to spit and water and all that stuff, all the garbage out of people's mouths, we have to have a mercury separation system through which that goes that captures the toxic mercury because it's toxic when it, before it's in the mouth, it's toxic when it comes out of the mouth. Please explain to me how it's safe when it's in the mouth. It, 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 is, it is not. I mean, it's just common sense, right? Um, and we could talk about this all day long. It's such a ridiculous subject. But, uh, you know, there's a video that's been online for well over 15 years called The Smoking Tooth. And it shows a dentist who uses an extracted tooth with a mercury filling in it. And he uses a fluorescent light and screen to show that you can actually visualize the mercury vapor coming off of that filling, right? And interestingly, if you heat it up, like let's say you're heating it up with coffee or a hot piece of pizza or a bowl of soup. So he takes an eraser and just warms it up with some friction. The amount of mercury vapor that then comes off of that due to the increase in, in heat is so considerable. So as long as you have mercury in your mouth that is exposed, and arguably even when it's not exposed because your tooth is porous, you know, and has the ability to absorb fluids and excrete fluids, you're being exposed. So you're inhaling it in the gaseous form. When you're eating it, it's mixing in with your food and goes down your gut and becomes, it turns from an, uh, an elemental mercury form to an organic mercury form in your gut as it mixes with the microbes that live there. It's highly toxic. You know, we look at the increase in, uh, you know, the amount of people experiencing gastrointestinal health problems, which, of course, there are so many causes to that, right? Uh, but mercury, like we've been placing that in people's heads just, you know, nonchalantly now for well over a century. And it's no surprise people are more and more toxic, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've also read a lot of literature on individuals that have mercury fillings have a higher risk of Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders. And again, we wonder why there's been such an increase. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of factors involved, but there's a pretty strong correlation there. And this is just due to my lack of knowledge on the metal itself. But does mercury have a life as to how long it off gases? So for example, should someone who has had these fillings for, let's say, 30 or 40 years, you know, is it even worth getting them out at that point? Or could you say that the mercury has already been released or off gas at that point? Yeah, my understanding and experience is that it's chronically giving it like as long as it's in your mouth, the amount that's given off is minuscule, to, to be sure. But <laughs> you know, how much to, it, it's kind of like this, think, think of this analogy. Let's say, you know, somebody decides for whatever reason at the age of 18, eh, I'm going to take up smoking, you know, and like, whatever, if you want to smoke, smoke, right? So you're smoking. It's like that first year that you're smoking, say a half a pack a day, that's probably not going to kill you, right? Your body has, you know, the capacity to manage the toxic exposures of things to which we're exposed throughout our life. But the more we bog down the system and the, the more we toxify our body, like kind of the, the external, you know, uh, cellular matrix, um, uh, you know, the, the more that ground substance becomes bogged down with toxins, the less able our cells are to healthfully respire, you know, we're literally aging ourselves faster. And at what point? does something that you've been able to clear at a level where you didn't experience symptoms then become something where now the cells can't manage their own healthful replication and, and lifestyle and it becomes a cancerous issue or 
uh, a degenerative issue, as you mentioned, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. I mean, I've talked with a number of, of patients. I've even talked with some dentists who had issues with um, seizures, right? That didn't start until after they had mercury fillings placed, by the way. After they had the mercury fillings removed safely and their teeth restored biocompatibly, they completely stopped having seizures. You know, so it's like we can't put stuff in people's mouths that's known to be toxic or or certainly non-biologically compatible and expect that the rest of the body is going to be fine with that. We might not experience symptoms immediately, but the longer we are exposed, the greater the likelihood of systemic complications. And that that's in my world, you know, my primary patients are from probably mid to late 30s to their 70s and 80s. You know, I mean, I'm helping people in that age range whose bodies have said, I've had enough, um, you know, along with all the other toxic exposures we have in this world. But it's ridiculous in my mind with the amount of much safer products that we have available to us today. Again, nothing beats, you know, God's creation. The natural stuff is the best. But if we're going to restore teeth, let's consider what's compatible for that person. And let's use those products to, to, to help their bodies be at their greatest state of health. Uh, there's just r- literally, there's no excuse not to. Um, the information's out there. You know, ignorance is, is not a good excuse for dentists, in my opinion. Absolutely. Can I agree more? And just curious, does the current health status of a person affect the decision or rather your decision to remove a mercury filling. So for example, my mom's naturopathic oncologist essentially said that she wouldn't touch my mom's mercury fillings like in a patient with active cancer for a few different reasons. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I do believe strongly in in having open and honest communication between me, the patient, and that provider. So I, as a matter of fact, two days ago, uh, Wednesday this week, uh, I had met a woman three weeks ago as a new patient. She had come to me. She's had her second diagnosis of breast cancer, right? Because they treated her first her, her first go around with chemo and some lymph nodule removal and this and that. Never once did they look in her mouth. And I can you know guarantee you if there's a problem in the mouth, they treat the cancer. And they don't address the, the, the root cause, which in her case, I believe strongly is coming from her mouth. It's going to come back. So when she comes to me, she's in stage, you know, get been given a diagnosis of stage four breast cancer. My argument to her is that if you want to heal and you believe that your body has the healing capacity to make you well again, which I absolutely believe it does, you have to treat the root cause in your mouth. And in her case, root canals. Toxic bone grafts that were placed thoughtlessly, which her her three-dimensional cone beam CT scan showed tons of infection around it, and two cavitation lesions where her lower wisdom teeth had been removed and and never treated. I can tell you, because it's still in my mind's eye, it was only two days ago, the amount of fatty degenerative tissue that I took out of her jawbone was, it's incredible. And In order to try to help her oncologist understand this, you know, we're sending all of her samples out for DNA analysis. We want to understand what has been living in these these areas of toxicity in her jawbone so that we can then share that with her oncologist. But her oncologist's approach was, hey, you've got to start chemo immediately. And you know what? It's okay for us to have a difference of opinion because we look through different lenses, our our training is different. Our understanding is different. But in order to help bring him along to my under, you know, my seeing through my lens, you know, I sent him a very detailed email about here's the science, here's the information, here's what we're seeing for this patient. I will share the findings as they come in with you. But I want you to understand that until we treat what is in fact draining in her lymphatic system, whatever you're trying to do is going to have no impact and no effect. No positive long-term effect. Her own her own history is proof that, oh, yeah, we treated the cancer, and it looks like it's gone. Oh, wait a minute, it came back. Why? Because we didn't address the, the root cause, which in this case, it was stemming from her mouth. 
That's so powerful. And this is an area I wanted to get into, but Dr. Veronique de Saunier, who you may have heard of, she's the author of Breast Cancer Conqueror and has done some incredible work in the field of addressing breast cancer naturally. But she's done a lot of research on the connection between root canals and the development of breast cancer. And in fact, her findings have shown that oftentimes in women with breast cancer, and this was actually my mom's case, the side of the breast that they develop the cancer in is often the same side that they had a root canal on. What are your thoughts on that connection? And what research have you yourself found that supports that, if, if any? Yeah, I think that it's a good question. Just look at patient history. It's that simple. And it doesn't have to be breast cancer. Like, I mean, it could be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of the cervical chain. Anything that drains from the mouth, right, down the neck, into the chest cavity, the longer that people are exposed, the more likely their own genetics are, and this will this will freak you out, right? I actually made a, I wrote a post maybe three months ago about scientific findings that when infection, chronic infection, again, this is like the long standing infection sort of a thing, is draining through lymphatic vessels over years our genes will turn off the ability for your body to maintain the valve system within your lymphatics so that, you know, because the, when we're young and healthy, let's take it, you know, breast tissue, the, the lymphatic vessels that drain the breasts, you know, back into our venous blood supply, um, they're one directional, right? So, although it's possible for anybody to get breast cancer, we tend to see it more in in aging people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The more that that the, the, the lymph system is backed up with toxic crap, the genes of our body actually turn off the ability to maintain those, the integrity of the valves and they decompose. It then becomes an open non muscular system where just think about what, what does gravity do? Right? I mean, the, the fluid from our mouths that drain down the lymph nodes ends up in the breast tissue over enough time. And, you know, I, have, I haven't yet had the ability to, um, like, extract teeth and, and, and do DNA analysis on those and DNA analysis on resected breast tissue. But it's one of the things that, you know, I would love to connect with, like, a surgical oncologist to, to look at that, right? But... When you look back to 100 years ago, Weston Price, who's, who's really well known for nutritional science and for waking the world up to the fact that processed food diets and poor nutrition has a massive impact on health and wellness, um, 100 years ago, he was showing multiple cases of when we take root canal treated teeth, we extract them from a human being, and in his case, I know I can't imagine doing this study in today's day and age, but he was putting these extracted root canal teeth under the skin of rabbits. Within weeks, those rabbits would have replicated the same systemic health problems that the human host had. So there's something about the microbiology and the biochemistry of what's going on in root canal treated teeth. I mean, it's literally a porous entity through which microbes crawl in once the tooth is dead and they sit and reside in that tooth, and your immune system has to manage its presence as long as the tooth is attached to you. Um, it's a toxic deal, right? Um, and it's kind of like you know the, the question about mercury. Well, for whom is it appropriate to remove those? I would argue any person who wants to experience optimal health would be appropriate to consider removing root canal teeth. That doesn't mean it's a must, right? There's no... Well, it's absolute. Every root canal is bad. It's not bad. I mean, you know, I mean, think about it this way. If <laughs> by the time a tooth is considering either a root canal or extraction, something is quite wrong. You know what I mean? The, the ideal scenario has passed us. So we're never getting back to ideal. So for me as a practitioner, I really lean into asking the, the human being that I'm serving, what are your long-term health goals? You know? And if it's like, well, I want to live a long, healthy life, I, I'd rather die healthy than die old. If I had to you know, pick between one of the two, I want to live a healthy life. 
we cannot have things that are non-biologically compatible, like mercury fillings, yeah. a chronic exposure to fluoride, which I'm sure we'll talk about, dead teeth, chronic bone infection. Those are incompatible with optimal health because the mouth is connected to everything else. Question on the infection point, though. I'm sure there's infections, right, that could go for years without a patient having symptoms. So how do, how do you actually identify if someone has an infected tooth or gum post root canal? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it begs the question, what do we define as infection? Is microbial exposure infection, right? So think about the body, right? We're going to look very simply. Our skin, like every part of the external part of our body and the gastrointestinal tract from one end to the other, we're completely covered in microbes and we need that coating of microbes. So that exposure to microbes is actually uh, biologically conducive and healthful. The second that we allow microbes entrance, like let's pick on something that's been common in the past 10 to 15 years, leaky gut syndrome. Okay. You hear a lot about this stuff. Basically, and I'm sure every listener has heard of this, but for those who haven't, you know, the uh, lining of the gut becomes porous, for lack of a better uh, way of saying it, or it's lost its integrity such that microbes, food particles, things of that nature make their way through the barrier that's meant to protect you. Well, as it relates to teeth, you have enamel that's impervious to, to microbes, right? It's rock solid. It's like granite. The dentin of the tooth, the second layer, which is approximately 80% of your actual tooth structure, it's porous like a sponge. As long as the tooth is alive and healthy, you have millions of little nerves that extend into those tubules of the spongy dentin. And they, they allow you to have feeling, they, you know, the blood supply that enters them keeps the tooth moist and, and able to withstand, you know, forces healthfully. But the second we remove the nerve and the blood supply and the lymphatic drainage of that tooth from inside, it becomes a dry, dormant sponge. And you know what happens with dry sponges? They absorb everything around them. So, and, and interestingly enough, microbes that live under the gum line, which is where that porous start of, uh, part of the root starts, they're about 5 to 10% the size of each pore or dentinal tubule within that tooth. So imagine driving your car through a huge tunnel. That's what that's that's all that's how easy it is for these microbes to enter inside the porous dentin of the tooth. And I'll tell you, you know, I did root canals for the first 15 years of my career. When you dry out a root canal, right? In, in order to fill a tooth with root canal filling materials, it's totally dry inside. There's no pigment inside that tooth. You fill it with a white colored sealer and a kind of a salmon-y colored gutta percha. There's no darkness whatsoever. It took me 15 years of extracting root canal teeth to notice that every time I took teeth out, there was always this black stuff inside the root canal system. And I'm like, it took me 15 years to ask myself, where's this stuff coming from, right? And it just, we weren't taught this stuff in dental. Well, I mean, we're taught that the dentin's porous, of course, but nobody puts two and two together to think about once we kill the tooth and it's this dry, porous system, what are the bacteria and, and parasites and whatever that's, you know, live underneath the gum lines? Where do they go? And uh, I have sent over 500 teeth to DNA Connections, which is a sister company to Biocomp, uh, where they can analyze over 100 microbes uh, from viruses, bacteria, uh, parasites. Um, it's fascinating to see what's living inside of these teeth. And again, is it infection? Well, I don't know if you want to call it infection. It's microbial exposure. How much microbial exposure is going to be too much or a toxic exposure for any human being? That's a bio-individualized question. So when do you extract a tooth? Well, that's, that's something that you have to talk with the patient about. You have to talk with their health team about it and come up with a plan that respects the goals and health spe specifics of that human being.
I love that approach. And I think to, you know, so many patients today, and this isn't even just within dentistry, it's within the healthcare system where the doctor will be like, you need this, right? You need a root canal. <laughs> you need, you need this surgery. Yep. And Dr. Blodgett, this could be a whole other conversation, but a patient does not need anything, right? Nope. And that's why it's so important that patients educate themselves on the topic at hand or whatever issue they're facing because the doctor is not right. And I think, you know, so many people place 100% confidence in that practitioner and take it as gospel. And in reality, it's really not the best thing for them. And I've experienced that a lot, even in you know my mom's cancer journey. And it's just made me very weary of, of doctors out there and, and interests. But again, you always have to be your own advocate. Well, I am so you just warmed my heart and made my day in saying that and addressing the language of expert to non-expert communication. And in my personal and professional opinion, practitioners who tell people they need something, it's psycho-emotional, psychologically and emotionally harmful to that person. Because what you're saying is, I'm the expert. I'm telling you, you need this. Who are you? And how dare you say that you, you know, I'm wrong. And it's just plain and simply, it's inappropriate to talk to another human being that way. If you believe in health autonomy, and I do, I'm so glad that you said that. It's one of the things I tell new team members on my team the first day. I usually try to tell them this actually when they're interviewing, because I want them to under, understand that your verbiage and word choices and thoughts will be scrutinized, period. I want for you to speak only the truth, you know, and that looks like basing things on that human being's own goals, not on our understanding. Certainly our understanding is going to play a role, but it won't be the guiding light. It's going to be about what that human being is asking for and how we can help them experience what they're asking for, not based on some dogmatic bunch of baloney that we've come up with. Well, that's why you're so successful in your practice, Dr. Blodgett, right there. Your patients, I'm sure, see that when, when they come visit. But Thank you. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And on a personal note, interestingly, so several years ago, I went to my childhood dentist for my annual cleaning, and he took some x-rays, came back to me, told me that I had a handful of small cavities that needed to be filled. And for someone who never really had a cavity in her life, I was I was very taken aback by that. So rather than making an appointment for the filling, I went home. I was like, I'm not going to get them filled. I don't really think I have cavities. And you're going to laugh, but I went on my Kindle and I searched how to heal a cavity naturally. And that was actually my first exposure to biological dentistry. <laughs> and I started reading all these things on remineralizing your teeth with chewing eggshells or consuming raw dairy and all of these natural strategies to literally heal a cavity. Right. Um, so is it is it possible to do that and remineralize our own teeth? Well, 100%. I mean, it's it's funny because like we're all aware that if you eat something highly acidic, your teeth feel differently than if you've just had a bowl of yogurt, right? And you're bringing up a really good point by the way about raw dairy and, you know, from grass-fed cows and looking at things like you know, vitamin K2 and its function in terms of remineralization, not just of teeth, but also of our bones. Bones. You know, it's basically K2 is the guiding light for like, where does the body put calcium? Um, Without it, it doesn't know what to do with that, right? Um, But yes, absolutely. Your own saliva, which is a distillate of your blood. So the healthier your blood, the healthier your saliva brings into your mouth From the second you start chewing food, you're stimulating salivary flow. Part of the eating process is you're going to have, as I put it, you're going to take a dip in the the acid pool. Just it doesn't matter what you're eating, you know, fermentable carbohydrates, what have you. Granted, there are more some foods that are more acidic than others, of course. But part of your saliva's job is to provide the mineral. As you're losing mineral in the teeth due to the dip in the acid pool that saliva is going to help to remineralize your enamel. So you're never at a net loss of mineral in your tooth structure, right? People who are experiencing that slow or sometimes rapid, depending on the the human being and their diet and lifestyle, as the, the enamel is losing mineral, there is a point at which 
it can be beyond the point of of repairing it with 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 dietary uh, and lifestyle choices, right? Like sometimes if there's a frank hole in a tooth, you're not going to remineralize that. Now that being said, you actually can stop the process of decay from getting worse. You know, um, it's amazing the things we actually can do with our own mindset and lifestyle. Um, and, but yeah, so it's absolutely possible to your point. Like there are so many good books and websites and podcasts and things on that. And honestly, uh, I want to, I want to give a shameless plug to the book, the dental diet by Dr. Stephen Lynn. Um, I love that guy. He's such a great human being, an Australian dentist who really wrote a, a summary of the findings of Dr. Weston A. Price, right? A hundred years later, he puts this wonderful summary together about oral health, whole body health, nutrition, how it all works together. And then the back third of the book is all recipes. It's so great. Wow. I encourage any any human being who wants to be healthy, buy the dental diet. It, it's I've had, I, I have handed out more to patients than I can shake a stick at. Um, I just love that book and I've had all my team read it. It's great. So check it That's out. That's wonderful. Well, I was just going to ask, so I'm assuming you incorporate that nutritional advice into your approach with patients. Is that yes. Simple? As a matter of fact, so, you know, I, I, I absolutely, I don't pretend to be an expert in all things, right? So like when people want to have good conversations about pediatric uh, biological oral health, you know, I, I refer to a different dentist here in town who's amazing at that. Um, if people want to have conversations about how to improve their nutritional wellness and all that, like there are people to whom I refer one woman here in Portland to whom I refer, I've referred people from around the world to her because she's so dang good. But, um, yeah, like I work in my, um, zone of expertise, like clinically, right. And, and, and conversationally, and I refer to, to other people who are more knowledgeable and passionate in those other areas where I know they'll, the patient will be best served when they have a team helping them. It also helps to amplify accountability, right? The more people we have patting us on the back to say, you know, Kelly, you can do this, right? We're here to support you in this. The better you feel about those choices. Um, you know, I've been doing this long enough to see what works and what doesn't work. And I, and I have seen absolutely when we get two to three healthcare providers supporting a person well, I mean, miracles happen. It's so awesome. That team approach truly does make a difference. Again, whether it's within dental health or any other area of health, I think you need to have at least two or three experts, even from different you know paradigms, thought paradigms in, in your treatment plan. Crucial. Yeah. So just going back to my experience, right, as a child and going to the dentist office, I know something that I would do, I think it was on like a biannual basis is those fluoride rinses, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I know that most dentists advocate for the use of fluoride, right, to prevent cavities, especially in children. And I know that the controversy over this has been a main point of contention, I feel like, for the past several decades since it was introduced, what, in like the 1960s? But I do understand that fluoride can negatively impact our long-term health, a major one being the development of neurological disorders. So what is your take on fluoride use? Yeah, I'm trying to be thoughtful in terms of how I use words around this. Um, I, w I want to acknowledge this first. When you expose a tooth to the fluorine ion, and that ion bonds to enamel surface, it is absolutely more acid resistant than the hydroxyl ion. So like, we know that. that that's been the argument of the fluoride uh, supporters for all these years. Um, interestingly, you know, in the world of oral health, people are still getting insane amounts of decay and, and cavity. Like, it's like, if this were the panacea, uh, no people wouldn't be going into dental offices with toothaches and cavities anymore because we fluoridated so many cities. Um, if it worked, it would have worked, and it does not work. Why? Because our diet and lifestyles, for so many people, it's horrible. You know, you can't go to Starbucks, get a 24-ounce, you know, sugar-laden drink, sip on it for three hours, and not destroy your mouth and your gut microbiome. 
and develop diabetes and Lord knows what else, right? It's like, but that's our lifestyle. We want to go get our quick fix energy, pick me up and all that. And it's, it is what it is. What we know scientifically as fact, one, uh, up until the 1950s, fluoride was not added to the vast majority of water systems anywhere. Now, certain parts of the world did have naturally occurring higher levels of fluoride. And we did see in those areas, such as Colorado, more dental fluorosis, meaning uh, a modification of how uh, enamel is formed that isn't healthy. You know, it's both less aesthetically pleasing and uh, structurally has lowered integrity. So, you know, that argument goes out the window. But if we look at historically, how is it that there were so many uh, groups of people over the last thousands of years who experienced no dental decay and they didn't have added fluoride in their water? It boiled down to, you know, diet and lifestyle, the nutrition that they were able to expose themselves to and their lifestyle. Um, we're also now seeing, and there are so many studies, anybody who's interested can pull up PubMed and type in fluoride, comma, IQ. Let's pick on that one, right? There are hundreds of studies that have shown that populations that are slowly and lowly exposed to fluoride over time develop lowered IQ because of how as you put fluoride in your mouth, whether it's a, a, a rinse in a fluoride tray delivery system or in your toothpaste, you cannot put it on your tooth without your oral mucosa absorbing that stuff. And, you know, anybody who's ever had like a nitroglycerin tab or uh, which probably isn't a lot of people, but many people have tried like chewing tobacco. We can all attest that nicotine gets across that mucosal barrier in a heartbeat, almost like it's IV. Um, even a, a person in like, you know, a diabetic person who's having a problem in the dental office, what do we say? You know, put some, some maple syrup or something under the tongue because they'll absorb it like it's an IV. All that fluoride you're putting in your mouth gets absorbed by the oral mucosa. And just like the mercury question, how much is too much and, and when does it become a problem? Well, every human being, that's going to be a different answer, of course. But if your intention is to live in an optimal state of health and reduce risks as much as possible for your systemic health, then why would you expose yourself in the first place, right? So, I mean, I used fluoridated toothpaste my entire life up until maybe 10 years ago when I became more aware of this. And I'm like, you know, I don't need that. I mean, I, I'm going to choose to do something else. Now, since I stopped using fluoridated toothpaste, have I ended up with cavities? No, you know, nothing's changed. You're going to laugh, but I, whenever I go for my annual dental cleanings, I find myself educating the hygienist just on that very topic, right? How fluoride is really not great for you. And it's so funny because they're just sitting there listening. They're like, wow, like I didn't, I didn't realize this. And it, it makes them question too. And they're the ones that are saying, oh, like make sure you're brushing with fluoride every single night. But also too, there's a company I purchased my toothpaste from. It's called Risewell. And they mm -hmm. created this mineral toothpaste powered by, I think it's like hydroxyapatite. Mm -hmm. But it's been shown, they said, to like remineralize teeth. Are there any other brands of toothpaste that you personally like to use or that you share with patients? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to go against the grain here. And I'm going to say it doesn't matter. If, you're, if your diet and your lifestyle and your saliva suck, I don't care what you put in your mouth. It doesn't matter, you know? And of course there's, let's be honest, right? We live in a capitalistic society where everybody wants to come up with a product that's the next greatest thing. And do I think that Risewell and Revite and, and Boca and like, are these all good brands? Absolutely. I think, you know, I love what they're about. Is that going to overcome a crappy lifestyle and nutrition? No way. But if you like, if you like a certain flavor or, you know, like for me, people ask like, well, what do you use? Well, I use a brand of toothpaste that's fluoride free and, and on the environmental work, uh, working groups, what is it? Healthy living app. It rates very safely. And it reminds me of the feel and flavor of the toothpaste I grew up with. Right. That's my personal preference. Is that what's going to make a difference in me follow, you know, like becoming symptomatic or not in my opinion? both personally and professionally. No, it's the fact that I eat a healthy diet. I get decent sleep. I drink clean water. You know what I mean? 
so that my body has the capacity to make great saliva. Because here's the real fact. When you brush your teeth, I mean, unless you're brushing your teeth for two hours, which I don't know anybody who does that, you're not exposing your mouth to that dentifrice for more than two minutes because you brush, you spit it out, and then most people rinse with water. You've now removed every bit of what you put in there, right? So it's like, is that, let, let's say we're going to be generous now and say that somebody brushes two minutes twice a day. So is that four minutes of exposure going to make a big difference over the 23 hours and 56 minutes that you're exposed to saliva? I don't think so. So healthy saliva, which again, I'll bring it back to, um, it is a distillate of your blood. In order to have healthy blood, you've got to have good GI absorption, good gut integrity, clean water intake, you know, um, good digestion, you know, so that we're getting our autonomic nervous system into a state of like rest and digest instead of, you know, trying to eat lunch while I'm looking at Instagram and, you know, doing, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm so cool. I'm a multitasker. Like we've got to yep. downregulate and I'm guilty of like, go, go, go to myself. Right. Yeah. So I'm speaking to myself as well, but, um, uh, it's such a whole body thing and there's no one product that's going to be like the miracle fix. It is. It truly is. I know everyone wants that one easy choice. This is going to solve my problems, but it's not. It's so many factors, as as you just highlighted. Couldn't agree more. Could you also touch on why mouthwashes made with alcohol are really not the best things yeah. for us for so many different reasons? Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you, it astonishes me. Like when you walk down the aisle at your local Kroger or whatever, you know, uh, you know, IGA or something, and it's like you look at who's buying all these bottles of Crest Pro Health or Listerine? I mean, it's literally so drying to the mouth and people are like, oh, but it gives me that fresh breath. I mean, so if you like that stuff, hey, no offense. You know, I mean, lifestyle choices. I believe in making your own choices. Uh, but understand, like, you were not created to need mouthwash. Um, when you keep your mouth clean, and you can do that, by the way, many people do primarily through just chewing healthy foods. Like think of the friction of chewing lettuce or English cucumbers. Um, that's pretty self-cleansing, honestly, or chewing nuts, right? I mean, that, that actually brushes your teeth as you're chewing. It's kind of frictional. Um, your breath is going to stay fresh when you're chewing healthy, good foods. So like, I don't know what's up with all that. Honestly, it's like a great way for big corporations to make money. There's no biological health benefit to it. Um, that being said, there are some health, there are some oral rinses that my team and I will prescribe depending on the risks of that person and the oral health issues that they're facing. So let's say it's somebody who's got chronic gum disease and we're helping them along with, you know, resolving their gum disease issues also getting their gut health, their nutrition, all that back on track. Um, there are some rinses that I would advise, you know, and of course there are too many to list in a show, but um, they do exist. And, but that's more of a, like a case by case basis. I, I don't Got feel it. like every person, every person should be rinsing with what, you know, X, Y, right. or Z. What are your thoughts on oil pulling? And for listeners, this is basically just this Ayurvedic practice. Um, yep. That's been shown to prevent cavities, help detoxify your mouth or your body rather. And it's basically just swishing a tablespoon of coconut oil mm -hmm. in your mouth for 20 seconds or so. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, number one, for those people who are listening and haven't tried it, make sure you spit it in your garbage can, not in your sink, because it'll harden up in your pipes. You know? Yes. <laughs> um, I, you know what? Honest to goodness, I've never personally tried it, but I've had n a number of patients who they swear by it. And I look at their mouth and I look at their gums and I'm like, you know what, whatever you're doing is awesome. Like it's, and, and, and for those who haven't heard of it, you're, you're literally making soap in your mouth, right? By the physical and mechanical motion of that oil mixing with the, uh, the ions of your saliva, you're chemically, you're making soap. So it's a very effective way. The challenge that for most newbies is it's very taxing to the oral muscles, the buccinators, the lingual muscles, to actually physically 
for more than five minutes, swish, 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 swish. Um, but yes, I have seen in many dozen people where that was their home care practice of choice. And it, it, they, they had phenomenal looking mouths. So I, you know, I can't argue with that. Interesting. Yeah. I, I used to do it. I don't do it as frequently, but when I did do it, I mean, again, I haven't really had a history of cavities, but I, I don't think it harmed at all. I think it helped my, my oral health. So. Yeah. You're not, I don't think soap in your mouth, um, you know, your own cre- self-created. So, and, and if you think about like, is there any karyogenicity uh, or the, the ability to, d- to create decay with an oil or a fat? And the answer is no. I mean, you're not, yeah. there's no way with coconut oil, you're going to create decay in that practice. So um, if you want to give it a go, I mean, hey, go for it. I would not swallow it, however, right? You want to make sure that when you're finished, you spit it into the garbage can. Definitely. I know. I'll spit it into the garbage can or my toilet. I learned the hard way not to spit it down the sink, but good, yeah, yeah. good perk for listeners. Yeah. Hundreds of years ago, right? We didn't have these annual dental cleanings, right? And I love your philosophy that if you eat healthy, you have a healthy lifestyle, your body does the work and it prevents cavities. So with that in mind, what is your take on how many cleanings do we really need, if any, a year? I mean, do we even need to see a dentist if we're abiding by all of these healthy lifestyle practices? Well, you could probably guess my my answer to that. It's it's a bio-individual question, right? Some people, due to their genetics, simply have a higher risk for inflammation. So let's say their risk for gum disease, much as their risk for heart disease might be, you know, higher. So the the recommendations around their care and maintenance from year to year might be different from somebody like me. I mean, I'm just the way that I've eaten food my entire life, my, you know, the, the microbes that my parents shared with me when I was a baby, right? All those things put together, I can go a year or two without a cleaning. Now, obviously I employ hygienists, so I tend to get my teeth clean, you know, but it's interesting because in my practice, you know, for 21 and a half years, we did a lot of cleanings for people Um, because of the shift in dental hygienists in the state of Oregon. uh, We had a lot of them retire their licenses early during COVID. Uh, It has been harder to employ dental hygienists. So I literally went from having, you know, four dental hygienists full-time to two dental hygienists part-time. And all of a sudden I don't have the capacity to do teeth cleanings within my business. It's just how it is. So for the past six months, we have done very few cleanings for patients. And again, because so many of the patients that we see travel from other states, like my goal is to have them find a practice who can do that aspect of management. And what we try to do as we are developing a plan for taking them from where they are today to an optimum state of you know, whole body and oral health, uh, we're going to make recommendations about what we think or feel would be an appropriate interval for recare, meaning how frequently should you go in for cleaning and checkups? That could be once every six weeks to three months to, I think, you know, for some of the patients I've seen for years, they could go two years without a cleaning because every time we see them, and it's funny, I'll I'll give this side note, for a lot of people, COVID was a good test on this, right? Because, you know, some people were scared to death to go to a dentist. Oh my, I might catch COVID. And, you know, so it was two years or maybe three years since their last dental visit. That is a wonderful test to then see, all right, well, with your with your home care practices, how well have you done with your own techniques and lifestyle choices? And I'll tell you what, there is a large group of our population where they really, they don't need to see a dentist, you know? Um, maybe a once every two to three years, maybe once every five years. For a lot of people, probably once a year is appropriate. Um, why is it once? Why, why are most people of the mindset that I need to go every six months? It's because that's the, the plan, their insurance plan, which in my opinion is such a waste of money. Um, yeah. You know, employers, like maybe your employer, right, they give you or they pay for, as a benefit, a dental benefits plan. 
But it's it's no different than food stamps, right? It's like, we're going to give you money to go buy food, but we're going to limit what you can purchase with it. I'm, I'm not somebody who wants anybody to tell me how to spend my own money. You know, I want to make that choice for myself. So I've, thankfully, we the most of the people who we serve, they understand this. You know, we don't participate in any insurance things because it's a racket. Uh, but, you know, the insurance plans that most people have say we'll pay for two cleanings a year. So they've got it in the mind that though that's appropriate. It's totally arbitrary. It is. It was literally created by the insurance, the insurance industry. Yeah, dogma. Dr. Blodgett, you should write a book. Just on your, your perspectives, I will be the first to read it because again, we Thank you. I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying. It's it's so spot on. Well, I'm 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 in the process of that. I hope I hope to have that ready by 2024. Exciting. All right. So next time I have you on, we'll, we'll chat about the book. Oh yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There we go. And just curious too, would you have the same approach then with dental x-rays as you would with cleaning? I remember just, just for, you know, preventive reasons. Oh, we'll take your dental x-rays. And as a child, obviously you want to mitigate radiation exposure when you can. So yep. is that really necessary for children to go through like yearly <laughs> dental x-rays if they're otherwise healthy? Right. No, that's it's a great, great, great question. Um, and, and this is where I would I would lean into Dr. Stacy Whitman, um, and I'm happy to connect you with her. She might be somebody you'd love to talk to because of her whole unique biological and holistic look at pediatric oral health. Um, what we know and and what I've observed both personally in my own life, my kids' lives, uh, my family's lives, and professionally is that there are people, because of their diet and lifestyle and home care practices, they just do not develop decay. You know, I mean, now it's not to say that they couldn't. There's always risk for it if they change their diet, let's say. Uh, A common common occurrence in this instance, since we're talking about like the growth and rearing of children, let's say you've got these kids and they've got healthy uh, dietary practices at home because that's the the mentality at home. They go off to college or something, you know, like that. They leave home at age 18. And now like, oh, I've got free access to soda at the dorm at the at the college where I'm attending and 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 risk can then change. It's not to say they'll become symptomatic, but they could. So again, we always have to think about what are the overall risks, all information included. Um and, and how do we make good, good biocompatible or bio-respective choices for that human being? I will say in my practice, for the first visit with every adult that I meet, I need a certain level of understanding in order to, you know, have all the information I need to understand where they are and what the risks are, right? Now, again, I tend to treat people with, they've already had root canals, they've already had teeth extractions and, are, and they're sick. They've already had mercury fillings. Um, So they understand, like, we have to gather the right information. But as time goes by, when is it appropriate to take x-rays? Well, for somebody in my situation, like, if I had a hygienist take x-rays of my teeth once every five years, for me, that's appropriate, you know? I've never had a cavity in my life, you know? Like, a a, a cavity as we uh, traditionally understand it. So, like... Why then would I take x-rays every year to verify what I already know? And I've proven to myself over decades of life. Um, So we look quite bio-individually at each person. You know, uh, their history is going to give us a really good lens through which we can see what would be most appropriate. Within that category, though, what about for a person with heart issues? So on a personal note here, and this is why I love podcasts, right? Because I can get my own personal health questions answered. But yeah, of course. Um, I, I happen to have mitral valve prolapse, which as you know, is a relatively common condition that actually often goes undiagnosed. But for listeners, it's essentially an improper closure of the valve between the heart's upper and lower left chambers. But up until several years ago, the protocol was that patients with mitral valve needed to take antibiotics prior to any dental cleaning. So I grew up following that protocol for years, doing a large disservice to my microbiome until they came out and said that, you know, it was no longer needed. But for people like me, I guess, who need to be extra cautious or aware during dental cleanings, do you have any preventative things to do to help mitigate that risk for infection? Or would you recommend 
having more cleanings than the otherwise average individual? Well, again, I think that, I mean, so let's look at like, what do we know about microbial exposure in the mouth, right? So we, we do know that every time you chew, so let's say I give you a handful of uh, almonds, you know, and, and you start chewing these almonds, the movement of your teeth in your gums and jawbone is going to create an exposure to microbes into your bloodstream, period, every time we do it. Thankfully, when we have good uh, you know, immune function, that's not a problem, right? It's a minimal amount, and our, it, it's actually kind of like giving your immune system a little bit of a workout. The whole system's designed to work that way. Um, now, in our practice, we frequently have people you know, whether they have systemic health risk or not, just because we know due to the nature of what we do in people's mouths, we're going to amplify exposure to microbes. Why not do a pre-treatment rinse with, in, in our practice, we use ozon, ozonated water, right? So, you know, you could use other rinses. There are other things that you could use. Um, as it relates to your specific situation, which is, it is relatively common, in, you know, but but to your point, how many people have mitral valve prolapse and don't know it? They might have heard that they have it, but don't know it, whether it is with or without regurgitation. You know, and then we're like, huh, uh, well, what do we do? Well, probably better safe than sorry, right? And let's, let's communicate with, uh, you know, cardiologist. How about, and I'm going to throw a freebie your way because you're going you're to love this. How about considering for somebody who has mitral valve prolapse, again, whether it's with or without regurgitation, wouldn't matter. How about we get them using a system of what's called perioprotect trays, which you can wear for 15 minutes a day with a diluted hydrogen peroxide gel that helps improve the microbiome of the subgingival microflora. Wow. Right? It's awesome. It also helps the hydrogen peroxide biochemically helps break down the chemical bonds of tartar so that when you're brushing, flossing, you know, doing all the stuff you do at home, it's way more effective and impactful. Interesting. Where could I get those? Uh, your, your dentist, you know, and if your dentist doesn't know, you walk in and say, I would like a set of barrier protect trays. And if they ask, well, what are those? Say, I'm going to encourage you to open up your computer that's right in front of you and look up area protect. Um, they basically either, you know, make impressions with alginate, you know, like hard impression, or in my practice, we digitally scan. So we scan the teeth and the gums, which then we email to the company, Periprotect. They create the tray systems, they send them back to us, and then we guide the, the patient on how to use them. It's super simple, right? You put a thin wow. bead of this gel inside the upper and lower tray, pop them in for 15 minutes. When you're done, pull them out, rinse them out, you know, spit out the extra stuff, and there you go. Now I'm actually excited to visit the dentist just to ask that question. Never heard about that. Interesting. Yeah, it's wonderful. We, we, oh my gosh, since we learned about them about seven or eight years ago, I mean, we have helped so many people with that system because it, it kind of answered the question of, okay, when the patient's here in my practice, I can use soft tissue lasers. I can use ozone. There's all these ways that I can positively impact the the microbiome underneath the gum line for these people but what do they do when they're at home you know and it's it's a simple safe predictable way and this company's been around for over 20 years it's, it's well proven to improve not only oral health but systemic health cardiovascular disease diabetes uh you know neurological health right so it's it's a wonderful system i'm a huge fan well, Dr. Blodgett, I'm sure at this point in time, every listener is probably like, I need a Dr. Kelly near me, but they want to find someone like you. What should they look for when seeking a qualified and reputable biological dentist? So first and foremost, like we are open to helping anybody who is looking to optimize their whole body health um, through the improvement of their oral health. Now, that being said, in a given year, I might be able to see a few hundred people, you know? Um, my area of expertise is the surgical and restorative approaches that remove toxic materials like titanium implants, root canal teeth, bone infection, and restoring their smile and bite with things that are biologically respectful. So 
that's kind of my area of expertise. Um, and we also help to refer to other trusted professionals around the country and outside the country. Uh, that being said, for those who are looking for somebody who might think or and think and behave like I do, that's a, it's a tricky thing because I'm kind of unique. I'm not patting myself too much on the back. It's just I, I've found that like very few people think as much as I do about how I speak and the words that I use, which I have then built a culture around that in my practice. That being said, I have a number of good colleagues around the country who I trust and who I would personally see as a patient, right? Uh, Like if you're in Utah or Connecticut or, you know, you name it, Minnesota, Florida, like, you know, I know people there. Um, It won't be me and it won't be my practice, but it'll be something that's very good and, and, and lovely human beings first and foremost, right? Uh... I will also caution the listeners that these days, I mean, I've been in dentistry as an active practitioner now for 24 years. I have seen trends come and go. Yeah. You know, the, the, when I first got out of school 24 years ago, cosmetic dentistry, you know, is the, I'm a family and cosmetic dentist, right? Like, I don't know what that means. That's just kind of like, really, I hope it's cosmetic, but, um, (laughs) <laughs> you know, these days, the words, the greenwashing of words, holistic, biological, everybody's using it. What does it mean, right? You, you call it the practice. Oh, it's ridiculous. So like the biological dentists in my town, good people, every one of us has a different understanding and belief system and set of experiences that steer what we think is biological care. So I was offering at the start of our talk about materials that are lowest reactive and most reactive for human beings. I mean, I'm thinking of a patient I saw about two months ago. She had seen two other biological dentists in Portland, Oregon. In both instances, the providers who are very well intended, you know, and and they're, they're providing a good quality in terms of the mechanical aspects of care, but they're literally putting materials in this poor woman's mouth to which she's highly reactive. And she's telling them it doesn't feel right. And understandably, the dentist is frustrated because they don't understand it. She's frustrated because she's like, I just spent tens of thousands of dollars and now my teeth hurt, my body doesn't feel right. And so the point being like, every provider, uh, you know, we're all in a state of learning. There's so much I still have to learn, right? at least I'm humble about that, that <laughs> I'll, I'll always quickly tell you what I understand is what I do not understand. There's so much where I'm like, I don't understand what you're telling me, but it's probably an area in which God's telling me I could learn more. Yeah. So as pe- my encouragement to people looking for a, a great dentist of biological nature would be to ask a lot of questions. Um, listen to your heart and listen to your gut. If something says, wow, I really feel like I resonated with them, I'll bet you anything you would be well served, whether they believe themselves or market themselves as a biological practice or not, you're probably going to be well served where your energy feels right, as opposed to somebody who says, we're biological, you know, ozone, lasers, like, well, what's that mean in terms of how you connect with human beings? Because that's a big part of helping human beings is connecting with them. Yeah, that doctor patient relationship is critical. And again, I, I think agree. people get so caught up within just like you said, all of the the gems that they throw out and verbiage that, you know, what's up and coming, ozone, holistic, but it's, yep. it's the person, right? It's the person. So yep. couldn't agree more. Yep. And Dr. Kelly, where can listeners find you? Yeah, please. So uh my my website is blodgettdentalcare.com. Um uh, I it would be the greatest gift that anybody could give me to go onto my Instagram page at Blodgett Dental Care and not just follow it, but like send it to every human being that you know and love. If you care about people in your life, get them following my page. Um, what I'm sharing literally, as you said at the start, Jacqueline, it, it, they are truths not commonly shared in the traditional dental setting. 
Um, I've had to learn the hard way. The, pe- the people that I'm serving have had to learn the hard way. And I want to share what we've observed over my, you know, almost a quarter of a century of doing this. Um, granted, there's a lot of dentistry being done out there that's awesome and it's helping people. You know, I want to be clear. There's a lot of loving, wonderful uh, dental dentists and their teams who are doing great work. Um, but when things aren't feeling right, whether that's energetically or physically or what have you, like trust your gut, trust your heart. And, and seek the answers because the answers are out there. Your body's telling you something. Um, and that's what I'm trying to share on my social media is that, you know, there, there are, there are answers. Um, so please share my, my Instagram page with those, you know, and love. Absolutely. And I will include the links for all of those in the show notes. My last question for you, Dr. Blodgett, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I don't want it to end, but I know I'll have you back in 2024 when we hear about your new book. Thank you. Um, but for the time being, my last question is, what does being well and strong mean to you? I think that's such a, by the way, kudos to you on a very good business name and marketing. It has great, great energy. Um, a big part of being well and strong to me, I was thinking about this last night. and Thank you for sending this to me in advance so I could consider it. It's, it's knowing yourself which at least in my experience, you know, I'm 52 years old. I studied psychology and that's where my bachelor degree is in, 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 in college. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand myself and others and great wellness for yourself. I have observed and experienced comes in understanding yourself first. So for me as a human being to be well and to be strong it's to understand that not only the great aspects of who i am and my personality but also the areas in which i struggle and where i could use grace and i could use guidance and mentoring um so understanding that we as as in our human condition we're not perfect as we are and we need you know, as, as a Christian man myself, like I need Jesus and I need my God connection uh, and I need people in my life who help support me in that and love me in that way. Um, to me, that's what being well and strong looks like, it, knowing yourself and being vulnerable and understanding we all can benefit from the support of others, you know, through leaning into that help, right? None of us can do it on our own. Uh, and I applaud you for what you're doing. I'm inspired by what you're doing. I just think this is great. And I thank you for the opportunity, by the way, to um, to share what we've talked about today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Dr. Blodgett. Amen to all of that. I couldn't agree more. And that answer right there is quite honestly the reason why that question is my favorite question is for responses <laughs> like that. So thank you for all that you do in this space and the incredible work that you're doing. You truly are helping so many people. And I am beyond excited to share this episode with listeners. I I already know it's going to be a big hit. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to support the show, please subscribe, leave a rating, and share it with others. Be sure to visit wellandstrong.com to access notes from the show and to stay current with new content. I'm so grateful you joined me. Be well and be strong.